But Genesis chapter number 19. I'm going to read more than one verse, Brother Ron. I'm not going to read seven of them, Brother Phil, but we're going to be in the middle. Begin reading verse number 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife, referring to Lot's wife, looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Now, I have preached on salt in the past. As I've... I was talking with somebody this week. They asked a question about, but you think God still does miracles? Yeah, all the time. They said, well, do you think that he turned somebody into a pillar of salt again? I said, I believe he could, but I believe he wouldn't. Because he promised when that which is perfect has come, that which in part shall be done away with. Signed and wonders are away of the past. Why do you think he recorded them? So that, that's a documented history of all of them. He doesn't need to because he already did it once and that was enough for God. But he's still the same God. He could. But just that God promised he won't. Now you can disagree with me, but you have the right to be wrong. Anyway. But as that conversation is happening, some things that I've studied came back to my mind. Keep in mind, before this, two angels were dispatched from God to go down to this city. They tell Lot and his wife and two unmarried daughters are in the room and they hear God's destroying this city. They hear the angels say, it's time to get up and go. It says it's in the morning. Then, right before the verse that we just read, when Lot gets down to Zoar, which was the smallest of the cities of the plain, it says that he entered into the city when the sun had risen. So he woke him up real early in the morning and said, today's the day, you got to go. Now he started dragging their heels. How do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because it says that two angels laid hands, one on the arm of Lot, his wife, one on each of his two unmarried daughters. Why did God send two angels? Because they had four arms and that's how many they needed. And it says that they compelled them. They dragged them out of the city to get them started. And somewhere along the way, the angels said, we can't go any further, but hurry up and get down there. God says it's acceptable for you to make it to Zoar. He said, but I can't start until you get over there. Because the two angels that just secured salvation for Lot and his family were getting ready to rain destruction upon those two cities. Go and study it out. The angels say that we will destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. God used the messengers that delivered salvation to also bring destruction. Well, who brought life into this world? God. Who brought in the new birth? Christ. Who's going to destroy the world one day? Christ. His ways change not. They've been the same since the beginning. But why did, he, why did he pick salt? Why, when Lot's wife turned around, why did he pick salt? Could have been a pillar of whatever God wanted it to be. It could have been a pillar of solid gold. Could have been a pillar of diamond. They wouldn't have been able to cut it. Could have been a pillar of rock. Why salt? Why salt? Also, Lot didn't write this story. Moses wrote this, the book of Genesis. But the history had been handed down from the patriarchs all the way down to Moses' time. God inspired Moses to write this account that he had heard about and been taught. Why was that pillar of salt so important? What makes salt something special well God tells us I normally don't do this either because I don't like flipping around but Matthew chapter number 5 verse number 13 ye are the salt of the earth but if the salt hath lost its savor wherewith shall it be salted it is sense for it good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men 
account of the same message. Mark chapter number 9, verse number 50. Salt is good. But if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Why salt? Because God can use salt. God couldn't use Lot's wife the way that she was. So he turned her into something that she could be used as. A pillar of salt. Now I said, Lot didn't write this account. Moses did. You know why she turned into a pillar of salt? Because she turned and looked back. But how did they know she got turned into a pillar of salt? Because eventually they came back looking for her. And it was then that they discovered she was turned into a pillar of salt. Because if Lot or his daughters would have turned, they'd have been turned into pillars of salt. It's a testament to Lot and his two young daughters that even though they couldn't find her, they couldn't reach out and grab her hand, they kept pushing on towards where God wanted them to go. But I want to look at Lot's wife. I want to look at this salt. And tonight I want to preach on savory Christians. Savory Christians. Now we know that salt is good. That's what Luke told us. Mark tells us that if salt has lost its savor, where's it going? How do you add salt to salt? Salt's good for one thing, being salty. That's why people use it. In Matthew's account, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if the salt hath lost its savor, the only thing it's good for is to be cast out in the street and trodden under the foot of men. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that the reason salt is usable is because of the savor. But if you do a word study like Brother Ron did on that word hope, you start looking up savor, it doesn't matter if it's referring to, you've heard the phrase, a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. You've also heard it referred to in modern day as if a food is savory, it's a taste. But regardless of which context, if you study that word savor out, it means acceptable unto God. In fact, if you go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, the first five definitions of the word savor all come from Scripture references. Well, you're saying, Brother Jordan, God has a lot to say about being savory as a Christian. But if we must define what is acceptable unto God, what makes a Christian savory or salty to the Lord, to be acceptable, right? It starts with what Brother Ron said. It starts with your spirituality. Hope is a product of spirituality, but it is your growing and active and thriving spirituality as the new creature that God finds acceptable. God does not find the old man acceptable. That's why he made you into a new creature when he saved you. God does not find the ways of the carnal man acceptable. That's why he told you to bear much fruit. Well, what fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. He told you to go out and be what God turned you into, not what you used to be. But when it comes to Lot's wife, I find that she lost her spirituality at some point. Now, the salt is still salt. Jesus said, if the salt hath lost its savor, it's still salt. It's just not savory anymore. There's a whole lot of Christians that are still on their way to heaven. They've been blood-bought. They're a part of the family of God, but they've lost their flavor. They don't taste like Christians anymore. They're not acceptable unto God any longer. Why? Because they've lost that savor. Where does that start with? You've allowed your spirituality to die. You think it's any coincidence that so many times our pastor says that every time we come into these doors, it's life or death. Most people take that as it's someone's eternal life or death. That's true. Every time a lost person comes in the doors, right, it is a life or death situation. You ought to strive to be sensitive and, you know, movable unto God to where if He tells you to do something, you do it not to grieve the Holy Ghost. Cause it to where He can't deal with that person and convict them as He like because you stubbed up on God in the pew. That's true, but it's also life or death for you. Don't care how long you've been saved. You know how quick it takes you to start dying spiritually? Just that quick. 
can happen with a thought, can happen with a word, can happen with an action. It's something that we ought to cherish and value far more than anybody else. You know that missionary, Brother Stubbs? You know what I believe? I believe that he thought his spirituality and his relationship, his calling from God was far more important to him than anything else in this world. How do you say that? Because he wanted to live a life that mattered for God. He wanted to live a life where he was above reproach to man, but also he wanted to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I wasn't perfect. But Lord, thank you for not throwing the clay away. Thank you for working on me to where I was able to be used. I wasn't always what I should be, but thank you for using me the way you did. That's the prayer of somebody that's spiritual. That's the prayer of Samuel. The Bible says that God took Samuel and let none of his words fall to the ground. You know what that means? Every word hit the middle of the bullseye. Everything God told him to say, it came true. And everything that he said, he said it just the way that God wanted him to. Samuel had a life that mattered for God. Why? Because he took his spirituality personal. He didn't rely on somebody else to keep him in line. Although you do need to rely on the Holy Ghost. But that's a relationship. That's not somebody doing the work for you. There's give and take. You've got to receive correction and reproof and instruction and allow God to make it a part of you. If you were able to wield this sword, you'd do a whole lot more damage with it than you would do good. I find when you let the Holy Ghost take it and start cutting away the things that he doesn't like, he leaves the things that he likes. Too many men get up behind pulpits and start swinging this thing around, and as we've heard tonight, cause a lot of damage, hurt people. Why? Because it's not spiritual. Well, what about Lot's wife? Well, at some point, personally, her relationship with God faltered. How do you say that? Because she just saw two angels, even the sinful, wicked men of the city, knew that there was something different about them fellas. They tried up, and basically what they showed up is, and they said, they're the most beautiful boys we've ever seen. That's weird. I've never thought that about another dude. But even they, in their sin-cursed, depraved, right, abhorrent state before God knew there was something special about them fellas. Lot knew when they came, go look, I mean, just a few verses before this, he's begging them for permission. He says, don't make us go of the long journey. He says, I'm an old man. He says, if we can't make it all the way out of the valley before y'all start, just let us go to that tiny city over there. And the angel says, that's acceptable unto God. Get over there to that little city. Lot respects him enough that he's asking them for permission. He's not giving instructions. She should have known that these were men dispatched by God from God to do God's work. And yet they said, don't turn around. They said, leave, and none of them listened. They had to drag them out of the city. What happened? She stopped believing what God said was what God meant. Because they said, don't turn back, and she thought, I can get one more look. Why? We don't know. I believe, Brother Ron, that there's going to be a lot of people. I find when the rapture happens, God don't give us a choice. He says, come up hither and we gone. It's a commandment. It's not a request. But I'm convinced if he said, if y'all want to, come on. There'd be some people that are looking at the Lord in the face and they'd turn around and look back to the world for something. Why? Because they're not ready to meet him. You know why they're not ready to meet them? They lost their savor. There was something that she valued in that city far more than she valued her own life. She knew. They said, don't turn around. You turn around, you're going to become a part of them. God's going to wipe you off of the map. But she didn't believe it. Or she believed it, but she had a whole lot more unbelief than she did belief. But Syrophoenician woman, what did she say? Lord, help mine unbelief. Lord, I believe, help conquer inside of me that thing called doubt. Lot's wife had stopped asking that.
Now, I'll give her this. She didn't have the Word of God. She lived before any of it had started being pinned down. Maybe Job had been written. But that had been an oral tradition that had been handed down long before Job was ever put to page. But you've got the completed Word of God and the Holy Ghost living inside of you. So why have we lost our Savior? We've got far more than she ever could have dreamed for. She lived in the time of the patriarchs where there was no open interpretation. But I find during that time, guess what? God still walked on earth with men. Look at Enoch. Those that desired to see God heard from God. They knew what God expected of them. And her husband, according to your Bible, even though he lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, was a just man, a righteous man. That's why the angels took him out of the city. Because even though he was in the city, Lot still had some savor left. He lived in the same place. He saw the same things. Was he the exact same as when he went in? No. It had an impact on him for the worse. I preached a message one time on the things that Lot sacrificed in order to get down to Sodom and Gomorrah. The things that he gave away that God had given unto him. And he was worse off for it. But the Bible still says he was a righteous man. He had some savor left. God still used him. They made him a judge because they knew he knew the difference between right and wrong. He was righteous. But somewhere along the line, his wife stopped caring as much about what God said. And she substituted it with something else. Doesn't matter what it was. Some people substitute the score of a goofy game more than what God said. That will impact them more spiritually and if God forbid they lose, right, they're going to be in a bad mood at church for a month. Things that have no impact on spirituality, but yet people let, allow them to affect them. What's happening? They're losing their savor. They let the opinions of men outweigh the standards of God. But part of that savor is not just your spirituality. Part of that savior or savor is your communication, your testimony. Right? We just heard it read. The illustration given that your life is a tale. He's not just making that up. In another place, outside of Psalms, it says it this way in the New Testament that we are written epistles known and read of all men. Your life is more than a story. It may be the only Bible that anybody ever reads before they ever get to the house of God. If a book doesn't have anything to hook you, if a book doesn't have any intrigue or any mystery or pose a question to you that you never thought before, you're not going to keep reading it. You know why so many Christians' books are dusty and they've been shut for years? In the eyes of the world, they got no savor inside of the pages. There's nothing there for somebody to find intriguing or different or peculiar. They don't find anything different in there than they see in the world. So they tell other people, that book's not worth opening. That book, it's not worth flipping those pages. Right? Savor is meant to be what? Tasted or smelled, experienced. You know what God desires from your life? He desires you to be tried by the world. They tried Jesus. You know what they found every time that they tested Him? He was perfect. You know what your standard ought to be? Christ. You may say it's unrealistic. I still desire to be just like Him. Well, in order to be like Him, you must be tried like Him. God's going to allow the veil to be lifted every now and then, that hedge around you, and the world's going to come in and throw everything that they can at you. And you know what God expects? He expects them to walk away with a taste in their mouth. Something different that came off of you that they've never tasted in this world before. People will act different because of how much savor you got in your life. You know why I used to when the man of God walked into a room, people stopped telling certain jokes? 
Or people would throw away cigarettes if they were walking down the street and saw the man of God come in the other direction because they had some savor in their life. Conversations would change when the man of God used to show up. And around some of them, it still does nowadays. But you know when that used to be the standard? When preachers were known to have savor on them. You know why people don't respect the office of a pastor? The world, I'm talking secular people, don't know nothing about church. Used to, they still used to call the pastor preacher whether they saved or not. Because they knew that he was worthy of respect. You know when that was? When men of God had the Holy Ghost on them and had savor. When you talked with the fella and you came away from the conversation believing, I believe that fella talks with God. Is it because people were telling him all of your dirty business throughout the week? No, it's because God gave him a word that he fitly spoke unto you and God could use it. What happened is just like Samuel, his words didn't fall to the ground. What happened? They had savor. Well, Lot's wife, her life, it didn't make an impact on those around her. Her testimony was wanting. Well, how do you say that, Brother Jordan? Well, she had two married daughters. You know who they married? Men that didn't believe God. I still find that the Bible says that if a righteous woman saved lives a chaste conversation before her husband that he'll be one for the Lord. That's not Brother Jordan's opinion. That's Bible. That he'll be one through what? Observing her chaste conversation. You know what chaste means? It means free of obscenities. It means nothing corrupting. You know what that sounds like? Sounds a little savory. Sounds like she got a little bit of salt in her life. But yet when push came to shove, Lot's sons-in-laws, guess what? They stayed the exact same way they were before they got married. Keep in mind, this is Bible days. You know who was in charge of raising the children? Mother. You know what Lot's job was? To go out and provide for his family. Because if he didn't provide, he was worse than an infidel. He deserved to be pulled out into the street and stoned for not providing for his family. So what did Lot do? He went out and worked. And what did Lot's mother teach her daughters? Whatever she taught them, it didn't make any spiritual difference. The only reason that the two that were unmarried were saved is because they were still a part of their father's household. Go read a little bit further and see what wickedness they did. Even after seeing the aftermath of God's wrath poured out on two cities, they still conspired to do evil. They had no fear of God. Why? Because they didn't taste any savor in their mother's life. When dad was away from the home, righteousness left with him. She may not have been openly sinful. She may have taught him some right things, but she didn't teach him the reason for being right. She didn't have any savor. Her communication, her testimony, didn't have any taste to it. But then finally, we find that she was double-hearted. She was torn. You know what the devil's always done since the beginning? He doesn't strive to completely undo everything that God did, because he knows he can't. He doesn't strive to completely turn every Christian's life into a mockery. You know what he tries to do? He just sows a little bit of doubt. Your flesh will do the rest. What did he tell Eve? God hath not surely said. God lied. Just a little doubt. All those false versions, you say, well, they're pretty close to the KJV, but they're not the same. You know why? Just a little bit of doubt. Most of the time, you know where you're going to find all that doubt? Usually in the footnotes in them things. But I've got a giant PDF file that I've got printed out. Just things pertaining to the gospel that they change. And you know what it does? Just causes a little bit of room for doubt. God's not the author of confusion. God wants you to have hope. Not just hope, a hope anchored within the veil. Steadfast, unshakable, unmovable. 
God put it there and God ain't moving it so it's not going nowhere God wants you to not be on shifting sands but what the solid rock that's why I made Christ the chief cornerstone because you knew that everything that on you is actually leaning on him why because the cornerstone bore the weight of all the other stones what's he put on you what he expects to carry because he said take his yoke upon you he says just come walk with me for a little bit I know it's heavy but I'm pulling you and your load and everybody else's load just come walk with me for a little bit God doesn't want you to doubt the moment you start doubting you're already defeated the moment that you lose assurance in what God has said you've lost your savor because you may go through the motions you may say the right words you may give the correct answer but there's no feeling behind it there's no conviction behind it there's no certainty behind it people can look in your eyes and know that you don't mean what you're saying you know what it sounds like to me sounding brass and tinkling cymbals and you're going to waste all the time on things you could have been doing for God doing what looking for answers well he already gave them to you you just don't believe them she was torn I believe she knew what God expected I just believe that she didn't believe she needed to be it and something caused her to turn around you know why she turned brother Ron because she didn't have faith that she had lived everything she needed to in front of her kids she turned around and was looking for her two daughters come, well maybe they made up their mind anyway she didn't have the peace of God that she had done what thus saith the Lord and she was torn she knew she couldn't lay her head on her pillow that night without looking behind her knowing that her kids didn't make it out she knew that the life that they had sold all those herds and originally Lot had all those herdsmen which was fighting with Abraham's herdsmen that's why the conflict was there and they went their separate ways they got rid of all that when they moved to the city what they do they build a new life everything that she had done to make that new place their home just got incinerated she's looking behind looking at what she had labored for because she hadn't been laboring for the Lord where a man's treasure is it's where his heart is also what was her problem her heart was in a different direction than where she was trying to walk that's the fate of any Christian that's lost their savor your feet can be trying to go one direction but your head's going to be looking the opposite one it's a good recipe for tripping falling in a snare or ending up in a pit it's not because God didn't do what he said he was going to do it's because you didn't know which way to look while he's trying to walk close your eyes and try and walk a straight line ain't going to happen in fact most of the time when they do that people end up walking in circles their body's looking for some heading so it just keeps leaning a little bit and they end up walking in a circle you know where the devil wants Christians without any savor and just walking in a circle going nowhere making no difference everybody else pointing and laughing at him look at that blinded idiot we're not blind truth has set us free a lamp into our feet and a light into our path why so we won't be blind songwriter said I once was blind but now I see why because God turned the lights on for you but when you lose your savior you put the light away and you're groping in the darkness again trying to find that middle ground between the world and what God expects out of you and you're never going to find it you know what savor is savor is righteousness God finds righteousness acceptable you know what savor is separation because God commanded you to come out and be separate he finds that acceptable you know what God finds acceptable Christians that are on fire back 
now I can't remember which one of the preachers text it was but if you went a few verses down it said to call out and repent to cleanse your hands you know what God finds acceptable repentance well brother Jordan I'm on my way to heaven you're still not holy because if you were you'd be God and we don't get a body like his until the rapture what are you saying brother Jordan there's always something to repent of it just depends on how salty you want your life to be. How serious you take it. You know what God finds acceptable? Obedience. He just said prayer is not a substitute for obedience. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. God's not impressed with what you can give Him. You know what He's impressed with? When you embrace faith and you do what God said even when it doesn't make sense. Because you are demonstrating that the savor that you've got in you is worth more than anything in the world. People that make an impact, they've got to be salty. I'll close with this. I've said God's desire for you as salt is to be tasted. Right? People are supposed to taste the fruit in your life and get a taste of the Lord and see that He is good. You know what the world can't duplicate? God. You know what God wants you to have inside of you? God. You know what God wants everything in your life to have fingerprints on it of? God. So that when people taste and see, it's got some savor to it. But see, salt, I mean, I just read it to you out of Mark. Salt is good. You ever eat a steak that doesn't have salt on it? Don't taste as good. Right, you ever make a soup and then somebody not put any salt in it and then it's just got all pepper? That's not good. Right, the savor actually, I'm told by chefs, I don't know, I just eat it. I don't make it. I enjoy it. But they tell me that salt actually enhances other flavors. Makes them stronger, makes them better. Butter's another one that does that too. It unlocks things that used to be hidden or weren't as potent. You know what God wants your life to be? Salt and light is what he also refers to it as. He wants people to get a taste of what's in your life and finally see that there is something that they missed before. It unlocks something for them. But if you make a stew or if you grill a steak, if you put salt into something to be consumed, when the meal's over, you don't go back and try to get all the salt back. Salt is meant to be offered, used, but presented. For what? For consumption. If you want to be salty, God tells you how to be salty, but you've got to be prepared to be used. Jesus said, what good is if the salt has lost his savor? It's not good. It can't be used if there's no saltiness. But people that truly are savory Christians, they're prepared for God to use up every last bit of them so that he gets the glory for it. Did not Jesus say that if any man would want to take up his life, he'd also have to lose it? Didn't the Apostle Paul say that he died daily? You know what all those men of God through the history that said, I gave everything to the Lord and it was worth it? They said, there's not much left of me at the end of the road. Go study the, the apostles. All of them died a martyr's death. What happened? They got used up. But you know what they were saying as they went out? It was worth being salty. Someone got a taste of the Lord and if it took me being broken if it took me being used, if it took me submitting myself to God so that He got the glory for it, it is all worth it. Because the saltier you get, the sweeter your relationship with God is. The more salt He puts into you, the sweeter life's going to taste. You say, that doesn't make sense. His ways confound the wise. But the saltier you get, the closer you get to God.
the more intimate your time with God is. And it doesn't matter what the world thinks. It doesn't matter what somebody says when they taste of the Lord. You say, you think what you want. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. What do you have? You've got that deep, settled hope that anchors your soul. You know why Job was allowed to have all those things happen to him? Because God knew he was going to stay salty. Didn't matter how much rain and water that the devil threw at Job, salt didn't wash away. But salt also is a temporary thing. You know why she was turned into a pillar of salt? So that you can't go back over there today and find where it was that she turned around and looked. You've got to believe that it happened. He recorded it to tell you that it happened, but you've got to believe it. Is not our life just a vapor? He didn't say that you were the diamonds of the world. No. They didn't say that you were the granite or the marble or any of these great edifices that have lasted for thousands of years. He said, nope, you're salt. Go throw salt out on your driveway. I mean, it was snowing on the way in. Hallelujah, my weather has arrived. Y'all get nine months of whatever hot weather you want. You know, toughen up. This is the kind I enjoy. I give y'all nine months, just let me have a few. But it was snowing. You know what happens? You throw salt out there and the snow hits it, salt dissolves. It goes away. It is used up. You know what happens when you put it in food? It becomes a part of the food. It gets used up. It's just there for a little bit. But you know the beauty of it, even after it's been used up a long time ago? You can go back and taste it. It's still got its savor. Does not the Bible say that their works do follow them? If God put it in the stew, it's still going to have flavor to it when somebody comes back and takes a bite out of it. Everything tonight was geared towards reflection on the last year and headed into the new year. You do realize that the only hope that the people in your life that you desire to get right with God have is for you to be as salty as you can get. Oh yeah, God could use a donkey to go out and start preaching to him like he did Balaam. God could use a rooster to preach to him like he did Peter. God could write it on the skies if he wanted to, but God promised that he would use people. And you know why God put those people in your life? Because he expected you to be salty enough so that he'd be able to reach them. The only difference between a Christian that is savory and one that has no taste is that they're either all in or they're all out. Man cannot serve two masters. He'll love one and or love one and hate the other. There is no middle ground. You're either growing or you're dying. You're either pressing towards the mark or you're retreating. You've either got your face like a flint fixed towards heaven, or you've got your head buried in the sand in the world. The only difference is that you choose. Every day, as Brother Phil said, how do you start your day every day? You've got to start your day choosing, Lord, make me salty. Salt can do a whole lot of things. That's the last time I preached on salt, that's what it was. Salt has a whole lot of great uses. That's why God said it, salt is good. But it's only good if it's salty. We've got too many Christians with God called to be salt trying to be sugar. God said that his ways was contentious. It would bring a sword, division. Conflict is associated with being salty. People want to be sweet. Let God be sweet. You were called to be salty. You were called to confront in your very life to be a testimony of the fact that the world's ways are wrong. Why do you think he said to be salty? And then in Mark he said, but live peaceably among all men. Your life will be a testament of what they should be. Let God use you to be sweet to them at the right time. But you can't be sweet until first you were salty. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.